everybody. This is Brian Stevens. We're going to, I see attendees jumping on right now. We're going to give them about another minute. Uh, everyone that's familiar with this series knows I like to start and end in a timely fashion so you come back. So I appreciate you being here. We're going to give it another minute and we're still going to have you out the door. Let's see. I got to do math. 1045. No, wait, 1145 Central Time. What's that? 1245 Eastern. And for our people way out west, I don't know what time that is. You'll have to minus like a couple hours, I guess. I, I can't do complex math. Um, so Jack is the producer. He's sitting over here. Thanks for joining, you know, for running and putting everything together for us. And if if you've not used go to meeting, I know you've used Zoom and I don't know what happened to Skype. Does anyone know what happened to Skype? Skype used to be a thing and it's it's over with now. Um, is that is it if you want to ask questions, there's a little bar uh, in your toolbar that says questions. Click on that and Jack will see the questions and prompt you if you have any at the end. But we've got a lot to fill. So I'm going to go and get rolling. OK, so let's get started and we'll jump right into our activities today. So good morning. I am Brian Stevens. I'm the CEO of a uh, case of public strategies and and our in case of K-12, which is our student services division. So there are a lot of new people here. So just really quickly about us is that I'm an old soldier and a lawyer by trade, and I, I will make no apologies for exclusively representing public schools um, and working with you because I think that the job that you're performing to help our next generations is so vital. So I feel like that's our space. We recruit students back to public schools from, well, home schools now, charter schools, other districts, private schools, and we help retain them because you are in a competitive environment now. And I know you want to educate and not be in a competitive environment, but you know that's, that's the society we have. And so our job is to help you be competitive and to get and keep your students so you can go do a great job. Um, two things that Jack wanted me to point out uh, coming up is one, a new YouTube channel. We're launching a new YouTube channel on how to influence. Now, those of you that know me, no, it's probably gonna have some manipulation and cult stuff and fun stuff. Oh, you got to use it for good, not for evil. Um, and so you, we'll do that as we we go down the road. And our February webinar series, we just completed our annual, our, our national poll on recruiting and, and retaining students. So the polling data is done. They're baking it right now. And we're going to share with you that data. Uh, it's national, um, national or annual national report. And one snippet that's kind of interesting in that polling data I saw last night was charter school parents are now more interested in, in thinking about leaving charter schools than ever before. Now, that's interesting. I think there's some opportunities in that, um, and we're going to explore that next time. So let's get off all that stuff and let's get why you came today. Um, uh, it's It's no secret that in the past year it's been super challenging and not just in the operational side i know you're all dealing with the operational side you know homeschool virtual how to deal with teachers all that so i can't even think about all the work that the superintendents and and, and their their chiefs have to deal with right now i can't even imagine it um but the communication we believe is just as vital vital to grow your reputation and protect yourselves and to get people to trust you and to keep doing what you're doing best so we brought two people that I believe are best in class in communications. I know there's a lot of you out there that have been doing great things, but the, 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 my two guests today have got some interesting stories. And you know me, I'm going to make them get real. We're going to talk about fails, stuff they struggled with, um, and, and, it, and it should be fun. So let me, let, let me real say that I know I'm preaching to the choir a lot because you're here. You've agreed to learn and grow. It, it's funny. Um, I've got Dr. Davis and Chief, who I'm going to introduce in a minute, Chief Phillips, is we put this out to a bunch of people, and I got one email from one district that says, we already know everything to do. We already know how to communicate really well. Well, then you probably don't need to be on this webinar. I guess you're done learning. I, I just, I found that to be so interesting for educators to feel like they were done learning, but I know I'm preaching to the choir. You're here. You're doing the right thing. Let me hush up. So um, first, I want to introduce Chief Phillips, and I think Chief Phillips is only on by audio right now so she is replacing uh, the superintendent dr ray for shelby county schools in memphis tennessee um uh, chief phillips though i think i'd rather have her don't tell dr ray i said that but i think she's going to be the right person now interesting thing 
about Chief Phillips is she started in this position as the chief of communications in April. I'd like you all to think about that for a second and realize what she's coming in to the world with, you know, hitting this. She was previously a reporter um, and really well respected. But where I first learned of, of Chief Phillips was she's a really big community volunteer and just helping everybody around her and doing all this charity work. It's, it's really humbling. And I think we're going to learn a lot from her. The second person, Dr. Davis, um, who is like superintendent in Henry County Schools down in Georgia. You know, she got all these awards, you know, the, the superintendent of the year. And the thing that I find humbling about dealing with, um, um, golly, I got tech issues going on on my computer right now. Let me, let me drop these update menus. Sorry about that. Is a thing I find humbling about dealing with educators is I've got a doctorate. I feel pretty good about my, H you know, my, my educational prowess on this stuff. And then I look at all her degrees and it makes me kind of feel dumb. So, you know, we're trying to bring you really smart people that are that know their space. So thanks for making me feel bad, Dr. Davis. I mean, you know, I mean, how many degrees do I have to have here? I, I, I got a doctorate and a master. That's just not enough. You guys are awesome. So we're going to put their full bios in the email when we uh, record this series and send it out to everybody that wasn't able to join us. So you know, the full bios are in there. They're awesome. I'm going to start with Dr. Davis first, and I'm going to ask you, can you give us a little background on the size of your district? where you're at, kind of give us a little flavor before we get into the questions, please. Well, you bet. Well, first of all, thank you, Brian. And uh, thank you to uh, Kesa K-12 for hosting this environment. Um, certainly uh, appreciate the introduction, but uh, now feel challenged to live up to it. So thank you also for that stretch. Um, and for sure, there is no uh, perfect recipe for effective communication in this season. So uh, much of what I get to share today is also a body of how deeply I've been listening and learning from probably many of you who are watching today, um, but I'm excited about this conversation. So I have the opportunity on the south side of Atlanta, um, Henry County Schools, we're 15 miles south of the Atlanta airport. We serve 43,000 children and their families in a community of 235,000 um, people. And, uh, and we right now, I think this is sort of part of our description, um, we right now actually have a um, option for families of whether to be on campus or to continue learning remotely. Um, we are a one-to-one -one district. So all of our students have had district issue devices um, for many years now. And of course that has been crucial in this season. And so our remote experience for students um, actually is with a district issued device and live instruction from a teacher. Um, we're at 41% of our families choosing to be on campus and, um, and that number keeps growing, which is a reflection of really our effort to communicate what it would be like to make the transition back to campus and how to keep oneself safe and healthy. Um, we are in a very diverse community with about 54% uh, of our community African American, um, 8%, I'm sorry, 3% um, Hispanic and the remaining um, uh, Caucasian. And we have right at 50% of our community is eligible for free and reduced. Um, so that's a little bit about our district and um, this has been certainly a season to strain um, our uh, uh, persistence in communication. And so I am really excited to also getting inspired um, by our uh, dialogue today. Thanks a lot, Dr. Davis. And Chief Phillips, I, I don't know if you got your camera issues corrected. Technology is always tough and we appreciate everybody for giving, but I hope you can hear us. Can you go and give us some background on Shelby County School District? Sure. Can you hear me, Brian? Yes, ma'am. We we can. I wish we could see you, but we'll take it. Uh, I am going to restart my laptop in a minute, but I have joined on my phone as well. Um, but certainly wanted to just thank you for the opportunity to share this journey. You mentioned me coming on uh, during the pandemic uh, as far as taking the helm in leadership. I had been with the district for a year as deputy chief of communication, so wasn't brand new to the team. Uh, but certainly, I don't think any one of us has led during a uh, pandemic. And so this has been very interesting. Uh, and it's been a growth area for me, certainly in leadership. So uh, just a little bit about Shelby County Schools. We are the 23rd largest school district in the nation, uh, the largest school district right here in Tennessee. And so right now, we have around 200 schools. That includes our charter portfolio. 
uh, around 110,000 students when you look at the, the full aspect of that and around 90,000 uh, students in our SCS managed schools. We are the second largest employer here in Memphis, next to FedEx. Of course, everyone knows that FedEx is headquartered here in Memphis and they have thousands of employees. We have around 13 uh, to 15,000 employees, if again, you're talking about our charter portfolio, but a huge base and an audience with our families and our employees. So it's so important to get the message uh, out and to be accurate and to share the facts. Um, when it comes to our community, we have uh, tons of adopters and volunteers and stakeholders. So it's also uh, a key to keep them informed and aware of what's happening. And then um, I know that Dr. Davis was just talking about the need in their community. We do certainly have a high poverty rate here in Memphis. And so we serve about 27 million uh, lunches to our students. We have the free and reduced program. Um, we have about 80% of our students who are um, African American and uh, about 22% who are white and around uh, one to two percent who are Hispanic. So uh, a very diverse population, but also still leaning heavy in the uh, black and brown community. So we definitely want to make sure that we're addressing the needs and supports of those um, of those students and families. Family. So again, a very large district here in Tennessee, and we work to make sure that everyone has the information and facts they need to be equipped to make the best decisions for their children. So, so Chief Phillips, let's let's stay with you for a minute because you know we do, you know, Memphis is large impoverished community, and I know that one of the issues was technology, the internet, and computer access uh, when everything shut down. Can can you give us a like, you know, I don't know if that was the toughest issue that you face, but that's kind of my first, we're gonna kind of stay in that in that space right now outside of normal COVID shutdowns. But can you tell us a little bit about how you communicated with the students that didn't have internet and what how you guys translated that? Or was there another issue that strikes you as the toughest issue Shelby County faced? Uh-oh. She might be rebooting. No, I can still hear a mic. Well, while she's getting that fixed, Dr. Davis, let's flip to you and cut us up a little bit about one of the toughest issues you faced during this time and how you communicated through it. Yeah, I mean, I think there is no shortage of tough issues, and I don't even know that I can mentally rank them um, because we reinvented school as we've ever known it. So I'd say the toughest issue we faced uh, was really in the first season um, that I've now categorized into three different seasons. And that's crisis response, which for us was like March 13th through June 30th. And um, then I call June, July 1st to November 1st, like crisis leadership. And then November 1st to today is crisis management and preparing to lead the future. And the, I've, I've started to divide it into categories because it really required different um, things from us. The, probably the hardest for us was in crisis response, when every day there was a set of problems that we had never anticipated before, and we were not only solving them because they were affecting students' academic status, teachers and um, classified employees' employment status, and, um, and really how are we getting our Board of Education in front of things, as well as keeping our community informed. And it was all reactionary. And I think as a superintendent, you really do, you lead prepared to respond to things, but you've got to be leading with logic for a future. And so to be in a relentless grind of reaction, reaction, reaction in that crisis response, it was, that was the hardest season for well, us. Let's, let's, since we know, obviously we're here to talk about communications. So during this time, what did you do to elevate your communications game to make sure you were connecting with people that, that probably had a lot of questions? What are some of the things that you did to, to communicate better during this time? Yeah, well, first of all, um, it really felt like I had nothing to say. We did not know what tomorrow was. We were really figuring out today. And yet I had a moment of re remind, like just what a good communication 101. Um, you got to talk even when there's nothing to say. And so I adopted and made a personal note that I've kept with me to this day, which is be, be human first, be emotional and be human publicly, then be clear on the tactics, clear on the plan, and then also save space to inspire. And so I started a cadence of communication to our community, largely through like Zoom video recordings, which I'd never done before. 
and um, and kept being real, being emotional, um, letting people know how I feel about the situation, being clear about what we're doing, and then also saving space to inspire that we've got this and we can do this as a community, etc. So that was sort of my overarching umbrella. Um, and then I, I examined every angle that we had. Um, yes, there was the Zoom weekly meeting, weekly um, recording that went to families, um, but I also began this cadence of communicating to our legislative delegation and all of the locally elected officials in our community. And um, Dr. Dave, like, let's, let's, let's compartmentalize yeah. this just a little bit. Now, if if Chief Phillips gets back on, uh, you know, Chief, just jump in here and, and I'll keep asking. Well, and I'm here some, if, if you can hear me. Good. I'll jump right back to you. We can. So I'll okay. jump right back to you in a second. I want to follow up on one thing with you, with you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Davis, is that you talked about over communicating. and um, you know, we're a communication shop, and I really preach a lot about communicating when there's nothing to communicate, because the, the psychology of a person will tell you that they don't fill in information when there's a void of information with positive things. They fill in no information with negative things, and it's just kind of a, a it's our part of our lizard brain, that, that, that caveman mentality that sets us up in a way to protect ourselves. And if we assume positive things, we could get, you know, eaten by a tiger. So it's like it, K-Man Times would say a bush is 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 rustling in the corner. If you assume butterflies are going to come up, well, you might walk to the bush, but you got to assume a tiger is going to jump out and eat you. So you got to be you got to be careful when you don't have information. So you mentioned over communicating when you had nothing to do. Um, I bet that was hard because people are saying we don't have anything to say right now. So can you tell why you why you chose to do what I will call the right thing? Honestly, it was really intimidating. It was intimidating to talk about something that we knew nothing about. And, um, and that, and that's, I think why I've compartmentalized that into crisis response is we, we did not understand the pandemic. Our healthcare professionals were not providing real consistent advice, particularly through our Department of Public Health. And so I felt like I was standing in the limb in the in the bridge between bringing some confidence to what we are growing body of knowledge around the pandemic. I didn't necessarily see myself as the right person to be doing that, but I was doing that. And then, um, and then people wanted to know about graduation. Well, in my mind, that is six weeks away. We got to get to Friday. So, but I, by not, I didn't ignore that people started worrying about milestones you know, personal milestones, right? Those milestones that happen in schooling. Um, and while, so then, so I really, I listened to that kind of reaction and I leveraged it. So like right early in April, I wrote a letter to the seniors that lot, maybe people on the screen have seen because that went across the country. And it was my heart and our plan. And even though really we're piecing together a plan, right? We don't know what May is going to bring. We don't know what June is going to bring. And so how people can stay informed of the plan and what we will use to decide the plan. Um, I would hear a lot of things uh, of people um, wanting to know how grades are going to be handled. Teachers really wanting to know how are we going to do promotion retention. Well, well, Dr. Davis, Dr. Davis, I know, I know you're getting a ton of questions, but the, the, the thing that I thought was really interesting and what you did is sometimes you put out stuff that says, we just don't know yet. Yeah, and that too. We don't know yeah. this yet. Yeah, and I thought that that was one of the reasons why, you know, I, I reached out to you and started talking to you is I thought that those, you know, to soften the, the, the rumor mill. Sometimes you have to say we're working on it and we, we don't know yet, but, but it's coming, right? And I thought that was really impactful. I do want to turn it to, to Chief Phillips real quick. Thanks for getting on. Yeah, we can see you now and everything. Great. Is... Can you tell us about one particular tough issue? And I, I can name two, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask you about them if you don't jump in, which is either the technology or the sports. You know, what happened when you shut down the sports? So which one, which one do you wanna get into first, Chief? Well, and I'll start off with uh, the technology because I was just mentioning, I know my, my uh, microphone went out and I was trying to reset everything, but uh, Superintendent uh, Dr. Davis mentioned them already having the access to technology before the pandemic. And we know that Superintendent Ray here in Shelby County, he had gone before our county commission to ask for funding for the one-to-one -one devices back in February of 2019. Now it proved that again, he was innovative. He was pushing for that even before this crisis. And so what he did, he spoke to that. He said, look, we've been fighting for this even before now we are in the need of this essential technology for our students to 
continue to learn. This is why we've got to push our school board to make this happen. And so in June is when we had the historic school board vote here in Memphis to uh, enable every student to have a device. So no, we, no, no. we hey, have Phillips, to... hey, Phillips, I got to cut you off. I got to cut you off a little bit. OK, because Go ahead. because you guys did a lot of things right. OK, but but <laughs> but look, you know, the reality is I know Dr. Ray was forward thinking and I want to encourage people to do that, but I'm not trying to teach our listeners today. See, I'm an old soldier too, before I became a lawyer chief is, <laughs> is, you know, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, um, yeah, Dr. Ray's great. Dr. Lewis, you're all great. Let's, but I want to get real because I think that's where we get some lessons. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you communicated though, the, the issue that this was real and you didn't hide from it. I thought was valuable. You reached out to the business community to start getting funds. And I mean, talk, I mean, that was, what I thought was really in, innovative. And I guess not the actually, fact that Dr. So Ray went to the county commissioners and they didn't take care of them like they should have. <laughs> so the access for all campaign, uh, what we did, we just spoke to the fact that our students, in order for them to succeed and achieve, they need access. And so um, first our board had to approve, we used our CARES uh, Act dollars in order to provide all of the technology and the hotspots. From there, we still needed additional support. So to your point, we had to go out and message. We had a call to action uh, for our business community and stakeholders to say, hey, now it's essential for our students to have headsets. We, we partnered with local media here uh, to do a full on um, telethon where they were raising money all day long to make sure every student had headsets. We know multiple students uh, have siblings in the home. And so they would need to be able to have headsets, which have been optional before for school on the back to school list, but now they were essential. So again, partnering with the community for them to come forward and step up as change champions to help the district uh, in providing the additional funding that we needed. We had Comcast, we had uh, all these different companies who stepped in and to be able to provide the additional technology that we needed to close the gap and to bridge that gap, it was incredible. But certainly to your point, um, you won't always get what you need from the, the bodies and the governing pieces that you have, but you have to reach out and get the word out and talk about the need in your community, the why. Uh, and then that is where you get people to yeah. step in. Sorry, I interrupt a lot. You know, I'm, I'm a real curious no, guy. No, you're fine. Guys. It's like so, so Chief Phillips, I'm gonna turn to, to Dr. Davis too in the same the same kind of conjury is one of the things I thought was really innovative and like let's start talking about lessons, people like lessons people can take away is that both districts here reached out to the business leaders for support. Okay, so Chief Phillips, one of the things that you did that was so cool was like this, like you brought awareness that we need these assets. You certainly go to the elected officials that so in, in Shelby County, the county commission funds the school board. That's why they had to go to the county. Not every state's like mm -hmm. that out there. Sometimes the school boards have taxing authority, but in, in Tennessee, they don't. And so um, Shelby County had to go up to the county commission, get approvals. They've been fighting for that for years. But but instead of waiting on them, you started communicating using earned media. And when she says earned media, what she means is uh, free, right? She means mm -hmm. free media. She means the reporters and the news stations to get their word out. And they had this telethon. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Then I'm going to Ask Davis about her reaching out to the chamber, uh, some of the things. Go, go ahead, Chief. So certainly with the earned media, we were really grateful to have our media partners already on board. So I'll go back a little bit, um, just to the beginning of the pandemic, when we knew we couldn't go back to classes, we shuttered schools. We were able to partner early with the media stations and they did what they call instructional TV lessons. So just my relationship with media here, I think we were able to leverage uh, some support and partners. Dr. Ray again, went out with a call to action to say, who can help us? TV station here in Memphis, NBC affiliate, WMC, they said, hey, we'd love to broadcast the TV lessons that your teachers are doing. That was the first part of this relationship. They started airing our lessons. We had high viewership. Teachers were excited to be on TV. Students were excited to tune in and see their, their teacher. And so that was the first step in just, just bridging that relationship with media. Then other folks were like, well, how can we help? So then when we moved into the one-to-one -one piece and we needed the headsets, we called it Headsets for Learning we were able to partner with the local TV stations, all of them, they said, hey, we'll provide the platform for you to get on to talk about the need, to talk about uh, what it is that's happening in these uh, multi-generational families where you have all these siblings in the household and everybody can't hear the teacher because they don't have the necessary headset. So speaking to the need and then them being able to be a driving vehicle and feeling like they're providing some community service to our students, um, they were just really excited. All of the media partners came together. We hosted a press conference 
And um, and then we went forward with the telethon that day. And we had folks like Zach Randolph from the formerly with the Grizzlies. We had um, all type of uh, local celebrities who stepped in, business leaders who wanted to be on TV. We scheduled time for them to come on again. They got the free marketing and, and advertisement and they were come, able to come on and uh, do their check presentation. So we had Wing Guru here in Memphis, restaurants, everyone was looking to step in and support and it all benefited the students of Shelby. Yeah, so, so, so Chief Phillips, you can tell she gets excited about it. I love it because she's so enthusiastic about it. But I think that, that a couple of the things that is really powerful in what Chief Phillips did that I took away was, is they had an ask. They weren't afraid of utilizing the media. So I think that that's a really big takeaway on, on what Chief Phillips did. They weren't afraid of the media. And I, I get it. I mean, I have a whole book on, like I have a rule in there, only a full trust or reporter uh, in, in, in my book. Now, it doesn't mean that well, that's your, their job. Reporters typically, if it bleeds, it leads, right? Typically, they are there to showcase the bad stuff because that's what people watch. I don't blame a reporter for this, but she really leveraged earn and free media, but they had a very specific ask and they put people into a, if you want to help, you can't say, well, just do whatever you can because then people do nothing. It was a mm -hmm. headset. We we need computers. We need headsets. It was a very, very narrow ask. And I thought that was so pro of you to get everyone to not ask for a million things, ask for something specific, get that. Then you can go back and make another ask. Now, Dr. Davis, when we were talking, you mentioned something I never thought about doing. Is I've thought about using earned media before. I mean, Chief Phillips did it better than I could, but 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 you leverage the chamber to, to get in. Can you can you give us a little feedback on what like you communicated with them? They communicate what were they trying to communicate out and tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, I mean a couple, just a couple things. A lot of people have acknowledged the role schools play in stabilizing the economy and really the workforce infrastructure of the community. So okay, well then I need to bring you in to actually help pull off this reopening of schools. So um really a lot of similarities in being clear that uh, first and foremost, our chamber has a voice and a uh, cadre of uh, stakeholders that they can communicate to. Can you please actually distribute our communication to your chamber members, your chamber directory? So we actually did a lot. You may not be a uh, family member of a school age child to know what's going on in your school system. This so there was an opportunity to actually increase the confidence in the school system by the chamber being the disseminator of information. So that was the first thing. Second thing is we've actually reached out on how can we show community care and commitment to our educators. And that's our most recent campaign. And we had a really specific approach that we wanted to celebrate um, our, our school employees as, the, as school heroes. And um, they have funded a School Heroes Work in Henry campaign. And we now have December 14th as a declared um, Celebrate Your School Heroes Day. We've had proclamations by all of our city officials. We have four different cities in our community, a proclamation by the chamber. And now we are adopting a school. And so they're reaching out and bringing businesses in to adopt the school. And that isn't necessarily monetary in um, the way that Chief Phillips just articulated their specific ask, but it's like we're in a different season right now. And right now it is, it's building community and culture back. And, um, and so that's been, that, I mean, that's just really been remarkable because people want to be engaged. They, like you said, they just don't know how. And so we have, n n there's no expense required to write an email to um, all of the teachers in the school you adopt. Um, we're putting sidewalk chalk at every one of our schools donated by our credit union, all facilitated by the chamber. And so every school will have sidewalk chalk next Monday for their adopted, whoever adopted them to come write messages all over the sidewalk. Um, and so I really think it's a different different goal than what Chief Phillips articulated, but still to not go to low, we can't, walk, we can't operate unilaterally in this work anyway. We might as well not communicate unilaterally. Well, well it, is, it is real interesting that it's so easy to just get into operations and the day-to-day -day affairs and forget that everyone has feelings and emotions. I mean, I do that all the time. I talk to my wife, right? And and the, the fact that you guys are leveraging new partnership opportunities to communicate your message and making specific ask, you want to adopt a school, you want to get headsets. I think that that's really powerful. And I, and I think we're starting to really, you're starting to see some leverage on that. That's, that I think that's a one really big takeaway from the day. Now, 
I don't like the term crisis anymore. It, 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 I think it kind of emotionally locks people up. I like the term disruption because I think you can kind of see a path through it a little bit. So during disruptions, you try a lot of things, right? I was really curious if you tried something and it just didn't work. Like you try to communicate something out, it didn't stick, and you had to kind of unravel that. I don't know who wants to jump into well, that Brad, first. Yeah. I did want to go back to what you mentioned about leveraging the media and not knowing how that will go for you sometimes, right? And you have to be very specific. So um, you asked the question um, about, you know, what ways communication, what, what, what did you find that may have wasted your time? And I wouldn't necessarily that say that any of our communication wasted our time, but we had to be really strategic in shaping the narrative when we were releasing information to the media. You know, in other words, we had to tell our own story first because you never know what angle or headline that that story is going to go left or right. So the media, they have a job, as you mentioned, to report fair and balanced information, but they also have that job to go and counter. So they're going to find interviews with family members or community members who don't agree with what the district is doing or the decisions that we're making, and that's okay. But again, it was our goal to be very transparent, even though there was a challenge with sharing stuff out with the media, we knew that it could go left. We wanted to make sure we were transparent. We were sharing the facts first with our students and teachers and families and making sure that they were very knowledgeable and aware of what was happening. Another piece, and I know we'll talk about athletics later, but uh, in regards to you know what we were told not to do, um, I think early on, and I think Dr. Davis spoke to this about graduations, we were told, look, people want to know exactly what's happening with graduations. Do not hold off on this announcement because people are emotional. You better get the answer out there quickly. But what Dr. Ray decided to do was just the opposite. We are, again, the largest district uh, here in Tennessee, which meant we couldn't do what the other municipalities around us were doing. They were hosting these small socially distanced graduations. and. We had to remind people, we're not them. We can't do the same thing that they do. We have 32 high schools, they have two. So the, the superintendent decided to hold off on making a decision and to follow the science and gather feedback from our school board and also from our graduating seniors. We had two board members who actually had students who were the class of 2020. So they were <laughs> emotional too, but it was so brilliant uh, of the strategy of the superintendent because it showed families that we weren't just making a decision for them, but with them. And again, it was an emotional time. This was a momentous occasion for so many families and people told us get get it right get the answer out there but we considered the feedback from them and we continue to make decisions with them so we were able to do a three-tiered graduation so over the a span of three months we put together drive-through celebrations we did a whole access uh, on our website where families could go in and see their seniors headshots and click in you know have this memorable uh type of website that they could keep so it was so many things that we were able to do once we listened. We stopped and listened to our community. And I think that was important. When people are telling you to do something just based on pressure um, and you know emotions running high, you have to step back and you have to listen and then you have to have a strategic plan. You know, Chief Phillips, I was, I was thinking of adding to that, like the one thing I kept telling my team is all people crave from us is the one thing we can't give them and it's certainty. But we can give them clarity. So let's not aspire to certainty but we can keep being clear and acknowledge when we don't know and 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 what our process will be to get to knowing. Um, so thank you. I mean, that just resonated for me. Well, and, and it's really about controlling, as Chief Phillips said, controlling your own narrative. And and, and I, I do love the rule. Once again, I, I've got a lot of rules on this stuff. It's if you're not telling your story, you're not controlling your own narrative. Somebody else will, either through gossip or misinformation or just trolling or being wrong. And so the fact that you're controlling your own narrative is was really important, Chief. And I and I love that you you guys control the narrative. And, and I bet you had a narrative written down, and you had your whole team get on board with that. And I, I think that that was I'll really my notepad out because I I want to take notes. I love the fact that you're moving away from the word crisis to disruption. And then she was speaking about what you don't know. You want to just provide that clarity. I want to take notes as well, just learning from uh, you both, you know, and, and, and your experiences. So. Yeah, yeah, and I think that this is the this is the best way to you know to, to and I think that's why we've got a big following today. I we reached four, we're well over four digits now, so that's exciting. Um, hi everybody, and probably all the California people are are jumping on now, and and uh, they're sorry they got in a little late, maybe. Um, okay, so uh, Dr. Davis, anything that that you you did, and you're like, eh, we're not gonna we're not gonna do that again. That that didn't really work. Yes, there is some things that come to mind, but one in particular is. Um, 
again, wanting to just keep push up, pushing ourselves to just make ourselves a little more accessible in a season when no one could be together. Um, we did some Zoom meetings, parent Zoom meetings, and then um, teacher Zoom meetings, and then all employees, and really did not think in advance how to structure that so that it didn't become chaotic. And because it, and it did. So one in particular, um, when we did our employee Zoom meeting, and this is back in June, people now wanting to hear how we're gonna get ready for the new school year, because keep in mind, in Georgia, we start in August and in, we ended in May. And so we, um, we did a, a Zoom meeting and we did not use some of the features of that platform in order to better manage how interaction occurred with the audience and, the, and myself and the panelists. And with employees, you want it to be personable. You want it to answer, you want it to be able to have Q&A and let people ask their questions, but that was a bad idea. So we did supple, so we did do other Zoom um, webinars and town halls of this nature, but we really structured on how to, to provide a question, how, what questions could be answered, how many questions we were going to be able to answer, and really set the rules of engagement clearly um, on the front end. And, um, and, and really we bombed the, the first one. And I, of course, it's hard to, you're, it's so embarrassing, right? Because I mean, in that case, I think we had 4,000 people participating. It just was bad. And, and you want people to have confidence in you. Everything is about increasing confidence that community and employees have in you. And I'm like, wow, that may be irrecoverable at this point. Well, and I, we think, can I think Dr. Davis, I think it's, it's funny. I do so many things that bomb that we test and test and test to communicate and connect with, we call them targets, whether they're your parents, your students, the caregivers, the grandparents, the media, how do we connect? How do we link up with them? And you've got to experiment a lot. And I, I have found, you know, at least in our experiences, people are pretty forgiving when you bomb. Um, and so you just kind of own it. And I know you you did, oh, well, this, this didn't work out. And you're sorry, and everybody gets that you're real. And that's how you build trust is really just being authentic and, and not being afraid to experiment some, but I do, not like town halls. Um, uh, so yeah, having pre-screened questions, I know maybe you don't always advertise that you're doing it that way, but we've seen PTA meetings, PTO meetings. I mean, whoa, that's democracy at its finest, right? So let's let's be, let's be careful about that. Um, Chief Phillips, so one thing, it, 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 to kind of set the scene a little bit, sports, and a lot of times for up and coming, uh, children that are, are not in well-to-do families. I, I grew up in a, I grew up in section eight housing, uh, single mom, all that battered stuff. It was crazy, right? It was not a good scene. And without the military, I wouldn't have gone to college. Um, I'd probably be like the, the great meth dealer or something. I don't know what I'd be doing, you know, without <laughs> sports and the military, like that gave me a leg up and I'm like, and that's a scary thing. I mean, you laugh, but you would have seen me as a kid and you know, like, yeah, probably is, and, and Dr. Ray, the, the school made a really tough call on shutting sports down, you know, and, and the backlash, how did you guys deal with that? And you give us a little flavor on that. Well, and you kind of, you kind of uh, alluded to the fact that you, you, you know that people will forgive after you make some decisions that they don't agree with, but then they look back and they say, you know what, you made the right call. But, you know, we just said um, that we continue to follow science and that we won't allow passions and emotions to dictate our decisions. Uh, we ask and continue to ask for grace as we made these decisions because we don't, we don't have all the right answers. As Dr. Davis said, we're in a time of so much uncertainty and people want definite answers. So, Superintendent Ray, he released a, a heartfelt video, um, and you know that was easier for us than holding a press conference when people are going to be, you know, upset and, and sharing all this, you know, this feedback. But he said, you know, I love sports just like anyone else. I'm a huge sports fan, and I know that this gives opportunity. But I love our student athletes more. I want to keep them alive. I want to make sure they're here with their families and uh, they don't have those opportunities to go off and do these amazing things if they get sick or if they, you know, get their grandmother sick or their mother sick. So we had to really lean uh, heavily on the science and what that looks like for black and brown communities. We strategically, again, released that video and it, it didn't stop the protest or the angry messages or the, you know, our superintendent received all kinds of threats to his family 
and social media went crazy. But again, we had to reiterate, we are the largest district in the state and we cannot base our decision on what small rural counties were doing with sports. An important part of our message was again, sharing the facts about the data, showing even, look, they have professional athletes in a bubble. You know how much money they're spending to do that? We went and we pulled the money and we pulled the data to show. We can't do that for amateurs and for these student athletes. We want to keep them safe. The NFL is constantly postponing games. College seasons were being canceled. And so we continue to push that as part of the facts and the science behind our decision. And then again, it proved that we cannot control this virus and we have to continue to take every measure to prioritize safety. So people still aren't happy. We still aren't playing basketball, um, but they understand and they see what's happening nationally. And they, they're they again, showing us a bit of grace, uh, just knowing that the local science here in Memphis, it's getting worse before it gets better. So so Chief Phillips, one, I've got five takeaways so far. I'll summarize at the end on this. And, and the fifth one that I, I got down is how firm you all stayed after that decision was made. And one of the toughest things about communicating well, and we're, you know, we're working to communicate to build trust, not to damage trust. You know, if you overpromise and underdeliver, you're going to lose trust. And if you make a decision and then you waffle and go back and spin because of pushback, you start to look like you can't be trusted and you look like a pushover. And the one thing you guys did that was great is you didn't waffle. Once you once you made a firm decision, you stuck with you kept communicating. Your, now, if you've got to change, you can change based on you know the, the the ground underneath our feet moves a lot, and it's okay to say we changed because the situation changed, and that's okay. I'm I'm not trying to say you should never be flexible, but in this case, right. you were right. You proved you were right. You were different, and you stuck to your guns, and now it's all it's all working out. Now, Dr. Davis, I do want one more story from you. You had a a tough situation. Uh, when you were going to start school on time and then you delayed it and then you went remote yeah. and you communicated that out. And I thought you were really authentic and real about that. Do you, do you want to share that right now? Can you? Yes, Please. I'm happy to. Yeah, we um, we were really all like forward motioned opening school on time. And then, um, you know, really the ground beneath us was changing as July, in July and over the course of July. And so we pulled our board together, a Zoom board meeting. And, um, you know, I made the recommendation that we delay the start of school and start completely uh, virtually. And I, um, I cried in the board meeting and I, I could not believe it as it was happening. And it's like making me want to cry right now. I was mortified. Like it just wasn't, it's not my style. It's not, it, I've never cried publicly. And I, um, I really, as we were concluding that meeting, I, again, I assume that is going to now result in people not having confidence in us. But instead, I, I've gotten all the hate mail as well. So certainly there's lots of anger, but I've also, that resulted in an outpouring of people who emailed, called, saying, I cried right along with you. Thank you for, it was like the great Henry County cry is what I started calling it. And so I think it goes back to accepting that we've got to be um, emotional, willing to be real. And we're so in this, and I'm sure Chief Phillips and your team, I mean, we are in this because we know kids are depending on us. Families are depending on us. No decision has been flippant or taken lightly and no recommendation to a governing board who's getting lots of community pressure has been taken lightly. And so, yeah, that was a pivotal moment for our community. And instead of it reducing confidence, I think it accelerated it. And um, that was just kind of a crazy outcome. And certainly I didn't plan that, um, but it, 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 it shows a culture of commitment, right? And, and yeah, so that feels like 10 decades ago, but yes, that happened in July. <laughs> Well, and I and I think so. I'm gonna I'm gonna give my quick takeaways, and if you guys want to provide a quick takeaway, and then we're, we're buttoned up at 11:45 right now. I got so interested in, I stopped looking at the time. Uh, sorry about that, everybody. We're still gonna get you here, so you can have a quick lunch before you get back to your desk. But let, let, I'm gonna do my takeaways in reverse order. I'm gonna start with the last one, which is it's okay to be authentic and real. You don't have to be an Instagram. You don't have to be perfect. People connect with people, not with robots. Not with artificiality and Dr. Ray and Chief Phillips got up there and they were real about the sports and they, I mean, it's tough. We don't want to do this. You are real about your emotion. People connected with you and they enjoyed it and it's okay. Don't, don't be an emotional, crazy person like I would sometimes, but, but it's okay to be authentic. Um, number two, um, work with partners. 
you heard some great stories today about different partnering opportunities to help leverage and get your message out. It only grows the district's brand when you have more partners advocating for you. And I think both people share great stories about that. Over communicate. We get as many as some estimates. Chief Phillips, you know this, 20,000 messages a day, as many as 15,000 advertisements or somebody trying to sell you stuff in a day. So you trying to get your message out is just really tough. You can't say it enough. You can't say the same thing consistently enough. And I, I think you guys were doing that. Control your narrative, right? Control your narrative. Control your story. Have it down. Let people know what you want to communicate. Don't waffle on it at the end. Stick, kind of stick to it. And if you have to change, change. But, but keep saying your message. There's an old story in political speech. When, when you're sick to death of telling your story, they've only just started listening. So don't get bored with your own message out there. And I think they've been really good about doing that. So Chief Phillips, do you have a, a you know a couple of quick takeaways that you want to get? I really appreciate you coming on board today. Thank you. Well, again, and we thank, we just appreciate Kesa for the opportunity because there's always this, this learning aspect of being able to hear from others and the challenges, not always just the successes of what went right. So I appreciate that, just really being authentic in um, some of the things that went wrong. But certainly I would just say again, uh, as a newer leader here in this educational space, that it has been so important uh, to ask for grace and extend grace to others uh, during this pandemic because of all, all of us are trying to get it right. Uh, and and then of course just using the traditional communication vehicles that you have but also just being innovative with those and understanding that um, you want to use what you have but then also bring in other people to be thought partners because we don't always have the right answers so the community partnerships have been excellent and we just appreciate uh, everyone here in the 901 community one of our key messages has been stronger together and we truly believe that we will return stronger to our classrooms and in-person learning where we know that is the best and effective way to teach students, but we have to do this together, no matter what the pundits and the naysayers continue to say throughout this time. Awesome. Doc, Dr. Davis, what you got a couple of quick takeaways for us today? I mean, really, my key takeaway is it does not matter what work you are doing if the entire organization does not see their responsibility as communicating it in the right time to the right people with the right tone. And how are your principals being equipped to be grand communicators? How are all department heads and beyond being equipped to be grand communicators? It cannot be a communication uh, team or department alone in this work. And, um, and so I've, I've learned a lot from Chief Phillips and, uh, and of course, always from you, Brian, and so appreciate Casey for the yeah. conversation. Yeah, I'm gonna add one more. You guys both been using ambassadors really well and your ambassadors should be your frontline people, your parent, not, not just your parents, but your, your staff and your principals. They should know the narrative that you produce and you can get that out. Okay, I've got to stop. I've got to keep going. You guys were awesome. I knew you're gonna be best in class. Feel good about it. I wish we had about, I, I could hang out with you for a couple of days about this. So we're going to send their full bios and everything so you can get to know them a little bit better and a link to this full video, Jack. Jack's on it. I'm not going to do it. Jack's going to get it done. To, we'll put in an email to everybody and uh, we'll, we'll get that taken care of. And remember, two new things coming up are how to influence series. I hope you'll subscribe. You're supposed to subscribe and do all that stuff on YouTube. It'll be fun. We're going to talk about win and fail communications. And I've already called out a lot of people for bad communication. Oh. Uh, and some people for doing it right. Um, so that's been fun for me anyway. Uh, and then we also have the poll that we're going to be releasing uh, in January, I guess. And we'll have a webinar in February on it. You'll you'll hear about that. So thank you so much. Let everybody get on your day. Dr. Davis, Chief Phillips, we're out. Thank you very much, team. Thank you. Thank you.